One of the few industries to show consistent growth, adding 230,000 plus jobs in the past year and a half. And surveys show continued growth and confidence in our sector. Connecticut manufacturers seem to be experiencing a similar resurgence with several thousand jobs added in the past year. And as the survey you all are releasing today shows, several thousand more jobs expected in the next two years. You know, it seems fitting that manufacturing should now be getting the recognition that it deserves because it is the industry that is most vital to our nation's economic strength and vitality. No other industry creates more value or has a higher multiplier effect, as we call it. And this results in a 17% compensation premium nationwide for American workers and an incredible 58% compensation premium right here in Connecticut. Manufacturing is also generating extraordinary wealth from overseas, contributing 57% of total export value for the U.S., and an equally incredible, almost extraordinarily incredible, 87% of Connecticut's total exports. This is really amazing, considering that only 10% of your workforce is in manufacturing. And of course, as Judy reminded us, manufacturing also plays the most vital role in our national security. It seems that national security is at the heart of Connecticut's manufacturing sector. From the legendary names for the rest of us around the country, those legendary names in aviation like Pratt and Whitney and Sikorsky, to the dozens of shipyards along your coast. Connecticut's companies and workers just make tremendous contributions to our national security. And for that, we are all grateful. And though I don't know for sure, and I was hoping while I was in Connecticut for a few hours, someone would confirm that those contributions probably include the birds that took SEAL Team 6 on their famous run. Is that right? No one knows for sure. OK. Well, this recognition and reawakening of manufacturing had caught the attention of some of the most important groups in the country, and particularly in Washington. DARPA, which is the Pentagon's advanced research agency, just held a competition for what it calls open manufacturing. It's designed to produce or to reduce the barriers to innovation, speed, and affordability of manufactured components by investing in a series of new technologies and tools to improve our ability to develop and manufacture low volume, high value goods. One unique aspect of this DARPA approach, which actually made me think of Connecticut, is the development of what they call manufacturing demonstration facilities. These would be centers where high cost, high value engineers and equipment would be available on a contract basis to help you develop, prototype, and test new goods. The goal is to bridge that so-called miss missing middle or valley of death between the R&D that occurs in our labs and in our manufacturing facilities and the actual manufacturing commercialization of new products. We at the Institute are involved now in a similar new partnership with the National Science Foundation where we're working with the companies that um, are funded under the Small Business Innovation Research, the SBIR grants, to accelerate the application and placement of those technologies into our small and mid-sized manufacturers across the country. And now as I look across the country, even some of our universities are looking at how they can better support U.S. manufacturing in a much more direct way. I recently visited my home, Commonwealth, Pennsylvania, and learned about an effort at Carnegie Mellon University that would move the manufacturing of the advanced robotics coming from their R&D back from Korea and Taiwan, where those technologies are now developed, to the United States. The longer term stated goal of the university is to make Southwest Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh one of the great manufacturing centers of the US once again. 
Well, these activities are all uh, punctuated, actually, and complemented by two uh, recent reports from two of the world's largest and best known consulting firms, the Boston Consulting Group and Accenture. Have you read these reports? They're ones that are euphemistically uh, about onshoring. What their research shows is that manufacturers are discovering that China isn't as cheap as everyone once thought. When you factor in everything from the transportation, the shipment of goods back to market, to the availability of workers, to the inflexibility of both the, their supply chains and the manufacturing processes themselves, the cost of producing goods in the U.S. is actually very competitive with the Chinese and that doesn't even begin to account for the risk to your intellectual property because, let's face it, who do you sue if a Chinese firm steals your idea or formula or business process? So it's certainly nice, I think, for all of us to see manufacturing have the spotlight. And I truly believe it's because we're on the cusp of a manufacturing renaissance here in the United States. But six months' worth of good stories like that does not undo three decades of negativity in this country. The steady drumbeat of manufacturing is dying, stories and reports, caused real and very lasting damage to the image of our industry. Nowhere have the effects of that damage been more pronounced than on the manufacturing workforce. American society used to greatly value and respect the men and women who built things. At the turn of the last century, the greatest names in our country were either industrialists like Henry Ford and Andrew Carnegie, or inventors like Thomas Edison and the Wright brothers. These were the men that parents wanted their children to be. This continued in large measure through the 20th century as high school graduates sought work at their local factories in their hometown. And college graduates dreamed of becoming the next rocket scientists. Well, that somehow began to change in the 70s and 80s, though, as parents instead began to see their children only as doctors, accountants, and lawyers. And guidance counselors began pushing students away from manufacturing careers and towards, and I do put this in quotes, college appropriate careers. In most states, school systems actually responded to this shift in societal priorities and values by reducing or eliminating the once ubiquitous both tech programs. Fewer and fewer students were learning skills needed to enter manufacturing careers or experiencing the excitement and sense of accomplishment that comes from actually building and making things. You know, concurrent to these changes, and quite frankly, I believe continuing through today, the general malaise seemed to settle over public education in this country. Dropout rates soared to over 30% of our high school students across the Graduates lack the reading, writing, and mathematical skills that are necessary to, and, and needed by society as a whole. Enrollment in remediation courses in higher ed just skyrocketed, uh, really burdening our higher education system with a sort of under-preparation tax. And employers noted a decline in the basic workplace competencies from punctuality to the work ethic. Well, the cumulative effect of these shifts was to dramatically reduce the size and the quality of the pipeline of workers entering manufacturing. Unfortunately, this couldn't have happened at a worse time in U.S. history. Beginning in the late 1970s and the early 1980s, as you all know, and accelerating after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the introduction of the internet, foreign manufacturers, particularly those in East Asia, expanded and began competing directly with U.S. firms, large and small. This began that very difficult and very painful transformation of the U.S. manufacturing sector, and I suspect 
All of us in this room have lived through this. I certainly don't have to remind many of you of um, the pain associated with that <coughs> transformation. But the companies that survived aggressively applied principles such as Lean and Six Sigma. You just heard from one a few moments ago. That was their only way to remain competitive. Other sectors that had high labor rates and low unit costs such as textiles were either put out of business in this country or forced to move manufacturing operations to low cost countries. It was one of those times when only the strongest and most adaptable firms survived. While the manufacturing sector that emerged was completely different from its predecessor, and again, we just saw an incredible illustration of that. Computer-controlled robots and machines now produced and moved goods. Clean suits were as common as hard hats. And workers were now responsible for the programming and maintenance of high-tech computer-driven equipment. What had traditionally been a low-skilled, routinized workplace was now a highly skilled, customized, and integrated workplace. And not surprisingly, it was around this time that manufacturers started to report a skills gap. They were unable to find workers who were qualified to step in and contribute to their operations. This was a real threat, because US manufacturers were banking on their ability to produce a high value good and stay ahead of their competitors through innovation. Well, without a skilled workforce, the innovation engine would grind to a halt. Now, to be fair, I have to say, manufacturers were as much responsible for this situation as students, parents, and schools. During the leaning process, many companies cut their training budgets to a minimum or eliminated them entirely. And that eliminated the traditional months-long training in the company that new hires generally would enter in days gone by. But few manufacturers had a choice about this, quite frankly, because the cost of such programs are very prohibitive in the global economy. And US manufacturers today are at a 17.6% cost disadvantage with their international competitors without adding the cost of a failed education and workforce development system to their structural burdens. But where manufacturers erred, it seemed to me, was in not transforming their HR or human resources departments to respond to their overall business transformation. Um, I, I hope there aren't too many HR directors in the room, because if so, I'm gonna have to leave town really fast. <laughs> But HR departments, quite frankly, are one of the last places uh, in a manufacturing enterprise that our fathers and maybe even our grandfathers would recognize today. We tend to post jobs on job boards, wait for applications to come in, select the best, though how is more art than science, and then send them to an abbreviated training program hoping they're actually going to learn on the job. One of my colleagues calls this process post and pre. <laughs> well, for the, back, for the past decade or so, manufacturers have managed to make this approach work through a combination of productivity enhancements, poaching from other manufacturers in the region, and a liberal application of duct tape, I'm sure. But time and luck are about to run out, folks. Between the coming renaissance in manufacturing, that will happen, and the impending retirement of the baby boom generation, Manufacturers are going to have to fill millions, and the number now tallied nationally is 2.7 million jobs in the next decade. And in fact, we're already beginning to see the problem today. You have heard it from your speakers earlier today. And nationally, our last survey, 32% of manufacturers reported moderate to serious skill shortages. And this was the summer of 2009 the height of the worst recession since the depression, when unemployment was in double digits, and a third of US manufacturers couldn't find the talent they needed to continue. The survey that CBIA is releasing today shows companies experiencing significant difficulty all across.
cause this day as well. Well, the time is right, more than right, for manufacturers to change the way they approach and manage their human capital. And we at the Manufacturing Institute believe we've found one solution that is an important answer to that challenge. The core premise of our solution is that manufacturing, in manufacturing, we have standards for every imaginable input and output. Whether it's the composition of steel, the tolerance of machines, or the failure rate of a part. Manufacturers can give the details of the standards to the third decimal point. So, now's the time to create a system that allows manufacturers to be as rigorous in the standards they apply to their greatest asset, human capital. These standards should not come in the form of used by traditional education, though, which measures primarily seat time through credit. Instead, our standards are competency-based, demonstrated through mastery and proficiency, third-party validated, and verified through certification. To develop our solution, which is called the NAM Endorsed Manufacturing Skills Certification System, we partnered with several other leading, world-renowned industry organizations to create an organized system of nationally portable, industry-recognized credentials. These credentials and the training or learning content required to obtain them certify that an individual possesses the basic skills required to work in any sector of the manufacturing <coughs> industry. And we tally 14 <coughs> sectors from aerospace to automotive, transportation, <coughs> distribution, and logistics, to medical devices, biopharma, to machining and metal form. Our system, if you're a visual learner, can be envisioned as a pyramid of skill certifications with an initial focus on the skills required for entry level workers. First, personal effectiveness skills. Will they show up for work dressed and on time? Second, foundational academic competencies, and for manufacturers, that means reading, applied math, and locating and using information. General workplace skills, which cover the fundamentals of business and teamwork, problem solving, the ability to learn. And finally, industry-wide technical skills related to basic manufacturing processes, such as production, logistics, quality, safety and health, machining and metal form, applications, joinder, and the like. In our system, the foundational competencies are grounded in ACT's National Career Readiness Certificate. Manufacturers across the country believe that every student should graduate from high school, ready for work, and ready to pursue post-secondary education and training. The NCRC, as we call it, is an indicator of that capability. The workplace and technical competencies are, um, our partners are, first, the Manufacturing Skills, Skills Standards Council and their certified production technician certifications. The National Institute for Metalworking Skills and Machining and their machining and metal forming certifications the American Welding Society's Certified Welder Series, and finally, the Society of Manufacturing Engineers, Manufacturing Technologist Certifications. This is a series of stackable credentials that an individual can and should learn on their educational pathways to great careers in manufacturing. You know, in reading the survey report that CBIA is publishing today, I noticed that the large majority of manufacturers here have never heard of these certifications. Yet at the same time, the respondents, the manufacturers, noted a significant problem with entry-level workers showing up on time and being able to read and write. I also noticed that every manufacturer was seemed to be having trouble finding CNC, machinists and programmers, tool and die makers, and technicians. 
And then I bet that over half the manufacturers would be willing to give preference to candidates with third party certifications, but only 18% currently do. Well, the certification programs that I just named are the exact credentials whose learning content will fill your skills shortages. I couldn't have asked for better results from your survey to make the case that we've been making nationally. Now, I know there are a number of educators in the room, and particularly my community college friends. The skills certification system that I just described is currently being implemented in community college for credit programs of study with connections down to high school through dual enrollment programs and up to four-year universities leading to pathways in engineering technology and engineering. We've mapped the specific courses needed to obtain the skills required to achieve each certification. We've aligned that map to educational pathways from high school through community college to four-year colleges and universities. And finally, <coughs> we've mapped these steps up the ladder to the jobs and salaries that an individual can obtain by entering a high-quality middle-class manufacturing job and advancing within their company or their sector. And this is not only coming, it is here in Connecticut. The Lumina Foundation for Education